Welcome to our third and last Is It True? And hello again to my scientific co-host, Eva Milinkovic. Good evening, Gerrit. Good to see you for this last Is It True? session. Exactly. And if you're joining for the first time, let me explain you. In this fast-paced program, three leading experts in the world of implantology will challenge stereotypes and share their opinions on the questions everyone asks. So let's dig right into it, Eva. Who is our first expert and what question are we talking about? So, is it true that immediate implant placement and restoration will become standard of care in the digital era? By Uli Grunder from Switzerland. I ask myself, what does this have with, to do with the digital area? If you look at the case from 1997, where we had to extract all the upper and lower teeth, place immediate implants, and change a prefabricated uh, temporary in an immediate restoration. And that's how it looked like when we finished the case, and this actually how it looks like after 25 years. So we had the right case to do the right thing. But unfortunately, we did also other cases, also in 1997, where I had to extract all these upper uh, teeth, place immediate implant, immediate restoration. This case, unfortunately, doesn't look good after five years. If you see on the x-ray, we have a severe bone defect, and we can also see it clinically. Because if we look at the, case, uh, the situation where we placed immediate the implant, you had a big bone defect. So that was the wrong case to do it, wrong indication. Can we do it in the aesthetic zone? Right. If you have the right indication, for sure. Immediate implant placement, immediate restoration. That's how the case looks after 5, 15, and 22 years. However, we have to give credit for this technique to Peter Verle, who published in 1998 already 14 cases where he did immediate implant placement, immediate uh, temporization. But look at the final result. The, from the aesthetic point of view, it's anything else than ideal. So most of the cases in the aesthetic zone, unfortunately, they have some bone defect. And then we have to learn how to do it to make it look good at the very end. So we have to learn how to bone, augment bone, learn how to augment soft tissue. And if we get a nice smile at the very end of the treatment, we have to have a technique that allows us also a nice smile after 20 years. So the answer is of this question, yes, it's one of the options to place immediate implant and immediate restoration, but only in certain cases. And that's very important if we look at this case where we started with an unpleasant situation and we get the right, uh, uh, a pleasant final result and look at the smile line before and after. It's very important and that we learn how to augment tissue, how we augment bone, and it's very dangerous if some of the lectures travel around the world, give you the uh, audience always the idea, immediate implant placement and immediate restoration is standard of care for almost all the cases, make it a short treatment time for the patient, less expensive. Yes, if you have the right case to do it, do it, but please also learn to go the way where you have to augment tissue and make an unpleasant situation more pleasant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Uli Grunder. Now, Eva, before we dive deeper into this, let's really make it clear. What is the biggest risk if we get this wrong, if we go immediate in a case that doesn't allow for it? Uli Grunder has tremendous experience and also scientific backup to speak on this topic. I know that the world is speeding up and we all talk about immediacy, but it is crucial to understand the biology and to study well clear indications for immediate implant placement, which are available in the contemporary literature. So we know them. And the guidelines, if they are not followed, we are running into a clear risk of failure. Exactly. Failing implants, that's something we should always try to prevent. And we don't want to deal with that, believe me. Yeah, exactly. But now it's interesting that Uli says this has nothing to do with digital, whether this is a standard of care or not. So let's refresh our memories. What, is, what are the key factors in determining whether a case is suitable for immediate implant placement or not? Yeah, what Uli, Uli clearly points out is the fact that immediacy has nothing to do with digital era, nor the aim to become the standard of care. The case selection, proper case selection with available diagnostic technologies and tools is the key. So there are so many patient-related and site-related factors such as 
let's say only some of them, available quantity and quality of the bone, quantity and quality of the soft tissue, adjacent dentition, opposing dentition, etc., etc. So what Uli stated is that we need to know how to build up the case in order to place an implant. If anatomical, technical, patient and site-related factors are not met, we don't have a situation in which we can safely go for an immediate implant nor immediate restoration. And he demonstrated that in cases with quite long follow-up, and I think a lot can be learned up from the cases that Oli shared with us. Exactly, beautiful. Now, before we move on, perhaps a little bit of a, a theoretical question then, because I hear what you say, but are there ways that all these innovations we talk about this week, all this new technology, is actually allowing more cases to go for an immediate implant? You know, uh, technologies and tools can help us in faster diagnostics, maybe help us in faster treatments, but we cannot convert a non-immediate indication into immediate indication. Exactly. We can't change the biology. And we can't change the biology and we need to respect it and we need to know it well. Very clear. Well, thank you very much for explaining. Let's dive right into our second question of tonight. Can you introduce us into the question and the expert explaining it? Our second video is, is it true that CAD CAM implant restorations perform better than conventionally made ones? Presented by Master Dental Technician Vincent Fema from Switzerland. As for so many things in dentistry, there is not a clear yes or no, nor black and white to this question. What we are clearly missing today to deliver this um, answer is the long-term evidence of those implant-borne restorations. And we are still lacking um, the evidence looking towards five plus years for those CAT can produced restorations. But what we can state on the other hand is that when we focus on the production workflow, the efficiency, the cost to produce such a restorations is clearly beneficial comparing those to the more traditionally produced implant-borne restorations. On the other hand, the, let's say, new application of monolithic restorations that usually is implied by the application of this workflow really brings in other technical aspects that clearly also state by today reviews reduce technical complication rates as mainly the chipping risk is massively reduced. Other aspects are the accuracy and predictability of these full contour um, restoration designs that really bring advantages comparing those to the more traditional workflows. So in the all, overall day-to-day -day application, um, the monolithic CAD CAM fabricated implant bone restoration, multiple or single, really has a lot of advantages comparing them to the more traditional approach. Um, in summary, that really states that we are lacking evidence to say yes or no, but all the little aspects down the road um, really point that the more digital, um, the more beneficial for our patients in the long term and clearly also for the entire restorative team as the workflow is much easier, more predictable and mainly also more time efficient in, in the total. So here is my reply to this question. Can we say yes or no? No, today we cannot. However, we can clearly state that we have a lot of advantages on the side of the digital technologies. Thank you, Vincent Famer, for this very clear and comprehensive video. I must admit, it almost confused me because we asked the question whether computer-aided design and manufacturing performs better. He says it's not scientifically proven, but then he lists a ton of benefits of computer-aided design and manufacturing. Eva, what is your reflection when you listen to this? To tell this? you the truth, if you want to talk about dental materials, talk to Vincent. And I'm really happy that he did this video on this because Vincent is the guy who has tried all the available and modern and CAD CAM dental materials nowadays. What he clearly states is that we don't have long-term data, five plus years, which are crucial to 
make and draw out some conclusions on performing better compared to conventional. Right now, for these CAT cam restorations, we have more or less only in vitro study and some clinical trials, but we would need more scientific backup to state this. And Vincent clearly says it, for now, I'm, go I'm going for a no, but I hope in future this is going to be a yes. Yeah, and based on all the efficiencies in the production, you can already see it's a yes. So help me understand, if we're looking for long-term data, what is the key data that science needs to show us to really make that claim it's better than conventional? What we know from now that it makes a workflow easier and faster, that even Clinicians can perform by means of 3D printers, milling machines, in-house softwares, restorations themselves. So it makes our life easier. What Vincent also said is that monolithic materials and monolithic zirconia has for, from until now been performing in a very good way. But we want to see stability of the materials, aging, color change, eventual mechanical problems, complications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Exactly. So we're looking really at the primary functions of that restoration with, with, with color and aesthetics, but also with function. And with that, we simply do not have enough uh, data or long-term data to, to ma make that conclusion. Which we are waiting for, and I'm sure that Vincent's team and other teams dealing with biomaterials are going to provide us with long-term studies on this topic. Exciting. So we are really at the forefront of science here at the EEO Congress. Well, and we're debunking and validating certain questions. It's time for our third and last question, not only of this is it true, but of the EEO Congress. Eva, what is the question and who is the expert introducing it? Is it true that we can avoid technical problems such as chipping in the future with the help of design, including digital occlusion and articulation tools presented by Guillermo Pradis from Spain? Hi. Well, first of all, I have to say that this is a tricky question since chipping is a problem mainly associated with the behavior of veneering feldspathic ceramic over either metal or either a ceramic core like zirconium oxide or even lithium silicate or desilicate material. Since CAD-CAM technology for monolithic restorations is a try and tested everyday use procedure, in this regard, the problem is partially solved. With no veneering, there are much less possibilities of chipping, especially with zirconium oxide restorations. Another issue is if this chipping is mainly promoted or increased by the presence of prematurities and interferences caused by an incorrect functional occlusion anatomy of the restorations. Historically, everybody has accepted that controlling a correct occlusion anatomy implies using a phase bow, semi-adjustable articulator, and individualized parameters. Supposedly, this promotes the absence of occlusal disharmonies and with that, the risk of chipping, ceramic delaminations and temporomandibular disorders, among other issues. The fact is that there is no scientific evidence in terms of quantity and quality that really supports that. Having said this, it is true that there are a lot of new daily publications showing the impact that CAD-CAM technology is having in obtaining the so-called digital virtual patient. This new approach should theoretically obtain a final prosthetic restoration totally in accordance with the desired occlusion pattern. For that, the role of intraoral scanners, virtual facebooks, and job tracking devices among other devices is key. Our research team is working on different control trial studies, but until now, we don't have rigorous enough results further than some clinical cases that are working correctly. Anyway, in my humble opinion, digital technology is going in the right path, and it seems that cat -CAM software and devices will provide effective digital virtual patients. But again, it is mandatory to have clinical trials well-designed and publications with the materials and methods section exhaustive enough to allow other researchers to replicate and validate the workflows. In the meantime, this is my two cents. Be very careful with all the spectacular 3D simulations and animation on virtual patients that Facebook or Instagram is showing us every day. 
most of the time is more a great movie than a natural and useful virtual patient. Thanks. Thank you, Guillermo Pradias. Now, Eva, I hear him say, careful with simulations and the virtual patients. It's great in the movies, but not ready for practice. Why does he say that? Dentistry is a profession that requires coordinated motor skills in addition to basic knowledge, acquired knowledge for ideal treatment execution and treatment plan making for our patients. So, talking about the use of augmented reality is nice, interesting, it's fun. It might be also used for some demonstration, learning, simulation, but it's still not a tool used as evidence-based diagnostic or treatment tool in everyday clinical practice. Dr. Guillermo, who has tremendous experience on treating patients, points out several problems that cannot be overcome by means of just talking about or showing technologies, and we need to take care of that and not to forget it. Exactly. He's also working on that in his own, uh, in his own science work. Now, this is the second time I hear you say there's no evidence yet. Um, stuff is being, is being done in practice, while we hear in the background that also the Congress Center is being turned down. It's really Saturday night, end of the Congress. It makes me a little bit philosophical on this last video, because how about the speed of change versus the speed of science? How about the importance of working evidence-based versus also innovation, which is often practice-based. Eva, to wrap up these Is It True sessions, what is your vision on that? You know, I gave it some thought. Because while the innovation can and should assist in the treatment planning, this can hardly be a clear-cut yes or no answer to all these complex questions. So recent advances in technology might not have turned the world of dentistry upside down, but they have certainly changed various parts of the procedures, both in practice and science, we should distinguish two kinds of technologies. Technologies that greatly facilitate or improve the current work or practice that we do, and technologies that radically change the procedure. So the first category of technologies is always welcome, and it's part of the race to innovative in the domain of the dentist practice. So science eventually tests these new facilitating technologies and gives us scientific evidence and seal of approval. As for the other kind that is for more disruptive, I would advocate for a more cautious approach and wait for solid scientific grounding, at least some peer-reviewed studies published in leading journals, for any mistake in this field might impact the patient life, right? <laughs> wow, you really gave it some thought. And I think I'm learning from you that this distinction between where the innovation is taking place, whether it's taking place in the workflow, in the efficiency, in the clinic, you say always go, not always go for it, but be smart about it and, and try and push yourself, but be very careful on experimenting on patients. Honestly, I think we need to try everything, but we need a learning curve in front of us, and we're going to get there, but we never never ever have to forget basic principles that we have been taught by studying dentistry and studying medicine and by sticking to the knowledge, reading the literature and following the innovations, we will eventually get there. Beautiful. Well, thank you for this beautiful wrap-up. It's time to end this session, and we hope that you learned a lot thanks to our experts and thanks to you, Eva, for your great contributions. It was a real pleasure, Gerrit. Yes, we'll see more of you throughout this online Geneva session here on Saturday night. This was the last Is It True? But later in the primetime debate, we'll also learn from you what we have learned in 30 years of implant dentistry. That's it for now from uh, Geneva. We'll see you back soon.